Okay, so today I'm going to talk, as the title says, about Jason and the shackle from knowledge graphs. I think that um, if you look at the contents for today, that's about one third or less than one third, a quarter, we'll be just talking about some uh, PowerPoint slides. But the majority of what I'm going to do today is uh, a demo of using JSONLD and Shackle in, from Python. Yeah? So today is probably slightly more technical than I usually do. Okay, so in the title we have the word knowledge graphs. You probably know that we are a semantic graph database company. But what we find is that the last two years we've actually primarily been helping uh, mostly bigger companies, but also some startups, to build their own knowledge graphs. So more services than we did in the past. And I'm guessing that some of you in the audience are already building your own knowledge graph. Now, these knowledge graphs are really on the rise. Yeah, if you look at the Gartner hype cycle for 2018, knowledge graphs were still about here. And a year later, uh, the knowledge graphs are already this high in the hype cycle. Um, so even Gartner sees now that it's a big trend. And we were in May at a wonderful conference in Columbia University. And um, this is page one of the schedule for that conference, just one page, where you see that now all the big companies are getting into knowledge graphs. Yeah, it's a, you know, the banks, Goldman Sachs, Capital One, Wells Fargo, Google, of course, LinkedIn, um, but also uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical industry. AstraZeneca was there, other pharmaceuticals. So again, it's really a thing. Now, knowledge graphs are. Um, complex, yeah? There's many, many different technologies that make a semantic knowledge graph. There's ontologies, there's the basic graph stuff with edges, there's pipelines for ETL, there's everything with semantics, machine learning, there's of course Prolog for, for rule-based processing, NLP is important, et cetera, et cetera. And when people look at this, they get kind of scared. Um, but again, don't worry too much. Uh, if you want to use a Lego graph, it's actually all easily accessible in the Allegrograph architecture. Uh, this is a very big picture that I can talk for more than an hour about if I wanted to. The only reason I'm showing it here is that we now at the bottom of the stack, yeah, we're an RDF graph database. Obviously we do quads and we also now can attach properties to our uh, triples. So we have a concept called triple attributes. So in that sense, it's, it's already also a property graph database. But just as important, we now also natively take in JSON and JSON-LD and store them as source objects. So now we're also a document store. That's all I want to say about this picture. And I'll leave it in this presentation so you can have a look at it later. Now, all the successful knowledge graphs that I see are all about data integration. Um, and because it's data integration, it's incredibly important that you have RDF, all the all the knowledge graphs that I know and see and help people with are centered around gross taxonomies. And you want to make sure that everyone talks about the same thing, about uh, owl ontologies for schemas, and then many IDF-based semantic graph technologies. Everything is based on the core principle of the semantic graph. That is one thing, one URL. If you don't have that, then you don't have anything. And we see that people with property graphs try to build knowledge graphs too, but the problem is they all have to reinvent semantics, yeah, to get to the point where you have one thing and one URL. Now this is all nice, but a problem that we see is that the user experience programmers and application developers that need to work with knowledge graphs don't want to learn the entire stack. Yeah? It's a huge stack and there's a lot of people that really enjoy working with knowledge graphs, but the application developers just say, hey, give me give me the objects that I need to display. So the question is, how do you make it easy for UI and application developers you have to make it easy to add data to a knowledge graph, retrieve data from a knowledge graph, or validate your data? And so this is a simple solution. We find that JSON-LD will help you add and retrieve and delete objects to a knowledge graph as easy as MongoDB. And then you can use a new solution called Shackle, which will help you to validate your data in a knowledge graph. And there's actually already several companies that have taken this strategy 
to help the developers. I was just at a conference last week in Germany where I saw a wonderful talk by a company called Tenforce that is doing all the linked data strategies for the Belgium government. And they have gone completely JSON-LD for all the data input and output and check off for data validation. Yeah? So these application developers don't have to go deep into the graph, they just can stay at the surface. So, so let's talk about JSON-LD. And well, JSON-LD is 100% JSON, so let's talk about JSON first. So JSON kind of won, yeah? It's now the lingua franca for messaging a data exchange. Um, you see more and more tools that are no longer based on XML, but to JSON and document stores are all based on JSON. Some of them do XML, but actually JSON is the main data format that people now put in the document stores. Yeah. And so the good thing about JSON, it's very simple. If you go to the JSON.org spec, it's five pages. And I don't know if you've ever been there, go there. It's a beautiful diagram, it's hardly any text, just a simple explanation. Of, of the, the JSON spec, and then try to go to the W3C webpage for XML, which is 60 pages. So it's kind of easy to understand why. And then JSON even adds some things that XML doesn't have, like uh, 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 arrays. Anyway, and if you want to make complex data types in JSON, you can still make them. Yeah? The other good thing about JSON, it's very easy to read and parse by humans and machines, easy to store and easy to program. Yeah? The support in every program, programming language, although it's the, 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 the most beautiful integration is obviously in, in JavaScript and, uh, and in Python, where you actually can store Python dictionaries directly as JSON objects in, in, in document stores. Now about the bad thing about JSON and JSON stores. Well, up till recently, there was no schema for JSON. There's now a draft and there's already a set of tools now that you, where you can use JSON schema, but again, it's not as like W3C. They're still working on it. But more importantly, there's no semantics for attributes. Yeah? Think about your relational database where you have tables and columns. And the column names usually just at some point popped up in the head of a developer, but there was, but there was absolutely no meaning that was conveyed to anyone else in the enterprise. Yeah? Whereas everything in semantics is about self-describing data structures and attributes. So that you, if you see an attribute, you can actually find what it means. So that's an important thing that's lacking from JSON. Then there's no setup for linking data. There's no official mechanism that makes it easy to link JSON objects together. And that also means then that it's very hard to do joins or graph search in the core of a document store. Yeah? If you read the MongoDB documentation, they tell you first think very hard about the queries you want to do and then format your data so it, it will accommodate these queries. But you, it, it's, it, it doesn't allow for any serious joins unless you want to do joins on the client, which always makes it very awkward and slow. Yeah? So here's some bad things. Now, what is JSON, how does JSON-LD help you? Well, it's a JSON-LD is still 100% JSON plus some additional things. Yeah. It adds basic schema support to JSON, although Shackle does it in a way better than, 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 uh, than JSON-LD. Um, JSON-LD adds uh, semantics to JSON objects. So now you know what does this attribute actually mean and how does it fit with this particular type. Um, and it also adds a typing system to JSON objects. Yeah? So not only do you now know what attributes mean, but JSON objects get the type and that makes life easier in many different ways. Then JSON-LD, as it's in the name, is all about linking data. So it's built to link data JSON objects together. And that also then enables joins and graph search in, sorry, I would say in hybrid document stores, yeah, where you do both graphs and documents. I'll change that later in my presentation. So if you want to learn JSON-LD, just go to JSONLD.org and there you find the playground. Yeah, and then you can just Play around. I mean, that's how I learned it initially. Let's see if I have it still open here somewhere. Um, no, I don't have it open. So anyway, let's just go to this this website, and um, I'll go in a little bit more detail. But there you can find the various ways where JSON LD will turn JSON objects into a graph. 
Another way to learn about uh, uh, JSON LD is just go to our website and Google for Allegograph Python tutorial JSON LD, and you get straight to example 19 using JSON LD, where we in fairly detail explain how to how JSON LD works and how you can do it in Python. So, um, so because I don't want to go too deep into teaching you how to do JSON LD today. Um, and then one more thing before I go into my first demo is. Uh, and JSON LD is literally everywhere, yeah. Uh, especially in e-commerce. I always lo love to show this particular example. Yeah, you can search for, uh, say, Mad Hippie Oil. Yeah, and you search, and then you get this picture. You look at the source of this page, and then just search for uh, at context, and there you'll find a JSON object that's ex actually a JSON LD object. And if you look at it, then at the bottom you see the formatted version of that object. But just imagine that these yellow things weren't in there. Yeah. And you could have an aggregate rating for hippie oil. Yeah. But what was missing is you don't know whether what brand means. Yeah. What is the meaning of brand in this particular case? Is it used the same in every particular instance? Well, because we use JSON LD, you see there's a little bit of hints. Yeah. You see that this, you can find the schema for this particular object at schema.org. And this thing that you're looking at is actually a type of product uh, that has an aggregate rating and there's even a subtype of offer. Now, this certainly is an object with meaning. Yeah? And so it's kind of fun to go on the web and to find all the ways people use um, JSON LD objects. Now, if you want to think about schema.org, yeah, I said there is meaning to say aggregate rating. You can go to schema.org and they have about 560 different types of objects that you could have on the web now with a whole ontology around it. So one of the objects is the aggregate rating. You go there and then you see just the first five, six properties of aggregate rating with the data type and a description. Um, and this can be downloaded as a JSON LD object when you refer to schema.org. Yeah. Okay, so that a little bit of an introduction. So let me now first go to a demo of JSON LD in Python. Um, the core of my demo is based on a, a crunch based data from early 2000s till 2014, where I have core objects in the database like investments, acquisitions, investors, and companies. And then today is not so much about teaching you about JSON LD, but more for developers. How could you implement your own basic CRUD yeah, with Allegro Graph JSON LD? Yeah? And I'll show you how you can add or treat Python dictionaries directly, uh, just like in other document databases. I'll tell you, show you how objects are indexed with triples, but also the objects are stored as blobs. And then just like in, in the MongoDB query language, you can retrieve parts of objects of values from queries, or you can re retrieve the entire objects. So let's go to um, a demo. See here. Um, so here I have a file um, benchmark.py, slightly unhappy name. And I'm going to first do a tiny bit of JSON explanation of JSON LD here, and then I'll go into my current space demo. Yeah, but first let me go to the top. So I have a, pa a little package called CRUD. It's uh, not official France code. It's, it's a simple CRUD implementation on top of our JSON LD. Um, and I'm importing that. And of course, I want to print, print, pretty print my JSON structures. I do that too. Then I open a database that I have test, and I clear all, out all the data in there. And then we have two objects that I want to show. So the first object. It's called event. It's an event it comes from the JSON LD website, where you have this context, which is kind of the schema definition for an event. And basically, it says every time when I see in the my JSON object the, the uh, uh, um, prefix ICAL, then actually replace it with this namespace. And the same for XSD. And then this line says every time when I see uh, the word ICAL DT start then actually make sure that the object of that attribute is an XSD daytime. 
Yeah? And then here you get the real object. You get an I call. You get a, the ID is I call event. Basically, this is probably the most important thing that links objects together. You basically are saying that the root of the JSON object is this particular URL. This will expand in a URL. It's a type event, and then the summary is a later Gaga concert. It's got a location and it's got the time. And so this is um, an, an, an example of a JSON LD object where the context is in the object itself, or you can refer to an external object. So in this case, we go to uh, jsonld.org and get uh, a context, uh, well, a, a schema called p person.jsonld, which by the way is part of schema.org. And then we have a person one, which is of type person. And uh, oh, actually, this person has two IDs, so we can't have that here. Uh, take that away. Um, so we have this. So let's let's put this data objects in the database. We have an event, and we have a person, and then we can add data to the database. Now, um, think I have a function called store, but this is the official database uh, Allegro graph call, which it says connection add data. The object can be one object or a list of objects. Allow external references mean that if you refer a JSON, a JSON LD schema somewhere on the web, that it's actually allowed. This is a safety thing. We also can tell the database to actually store the source of the JSON LD. And we can say that the fourth element of every triple that you store uh, is the root of the JSON LD object. And so now let me store these two objects. So we've, we store these two objects here. And now let me go to our tool Gruff. Now, I don't know if there's people in the audience that have never seen Gruff, but Gruff is our um, client on top of Allegro Graph that allows you to look at triples in many, many, in many, many different ways. So let me just look at the objects that I added to the database. I had one event. This is the event, and let me also look at the classes. And I had one person. Yeah, and this is Jane Doe. Uh, and I can double click on event. And here you see, oh, actually I did it twice. I did, forgot to clear. So here we see that we did add an event twice. So we have a start of an event. We have the location. Uh, we have the source object. Uh, and then we have the type. Yeah, so this is how things get in the database. Sorry that I added the object twice. Um, OK, so that's actually all I wanted to show about how we do the translation. Um, to get objects as JSON LD objects in the database and how they are shown. So now we're going to the demo with Crunchbase. Yeah? So on our website, we actually have a file uh, called uh, crunchbase.jsonld, which is the data that you can use yourself if you wanted to. Yeah? And so I have that file, and it's a JSON lines file. So every line is a JSON LD object. And in that object, we have 179,000 objects. Um, let me open the database. Um, and before we do that, I'm first going to show you what's in that database. So I'm going back here. And I uh, open the triple store Crunchbase. Mm, where is it? Here's Crunchbase. OK. Um, I open database. And let me show you um, some data. For example, let's look for MongoDB. Yeah, we have here MongoDB. And MongoDB had several investments around, around it. So I could actually do this and say, um, the seven seven investment rounds for MongoDB. And uh, actually, let me check this. And so here's the ones. And so who are the people that actually invested in this? So I can push a button. This is not a graph lecture, so I'm not going to explain too much. But I can actually look at each of those. And I can look at the, oh, let me do this, the investor for each of them. Who was the investor? So there was two investors here. And there were three investors here. And there were some investors here. And there 
There's some investors there. Oh, there's a whole bunch of investors. And some investors here. And then some investors here. And then we get all of them. Yeah, if I look at it this way, then here you see uh, the investments. Actually, if I wanted to, I can even look at the, how things build up over time, but that doesn't matter for not right now. So here you see that MongoDB um, had investments, and I can look at MongoDB itself as an object. Yeah, and I see the category cloud computing databases, open source software. Um, when it got its first funding, is that the basic object from MongoDB. And uh, here you see, for example, Incutel, which in all the, the companies that it invested in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. And so I hope this makes sense. I could also look at Couchbase, for example. Couch, see I have Couchbase, this Couchbase. And I could actually look for Couchbase um, for all the investors. Let me do get all the predicates and let's do the acquiry acquirer. So I'm selecting all the predicates that are available for this system and the investee and the investors. And here you see the people that invested in Couchbase. And I could select those people and I could look at the people that invested in this. Yeah, so here you see, and one interesting thing you see is that people that actually invested in MongoDB don't invest, didn't invest in Couchbase, and people that invested in Couchbase didn't invest in uh, MongoDB. Yeah. Now, but one thing that I'm going to show you later in the demo is that although they don't bet against themselves by betting on two document stores, uh, they still do investments together. So I can take any of these people, yeah, and I could um, say, how does Docomo Capital, did they ever work together with uh, Union Square Ventures? Yeah, and then you find this 64 shared investments between Docomo Capital and Union Square Ventures. So I can, so let's just select two of them. Yeah. And so now let me do the whole thing here. And then you see that. Docomo Capital invested in Couchbase, Sequoia Capital invested in MongoDB, but here you see how they also invested in some other companies together. And I could look at this one here and I could see who they actually invested in. It's in a company called Stoke, and we could say, what are they, what do these people actually do? Oh, they invest in mobile. Yeah. So one other thing I can actually do with this, uh, with, so I, I hope you get the point. Yeah? So we're looking at a graph and I'm looking at the shortest path between various things to investments and acquisitions. And one query I'm going to do later is, what are the things, so we have investors in MongoDB, we have investors in Crowdspace, and we also have these investors that do other ventures together. So what other things that you do together do they actually invest in? What category of things? So I actually can build a query on the screen for that. Yeah. So I could literally say, okay, well, let's say um, MongoDB, the suspension with Sequoia, but this in a particular company where Docomo invested in Couchbase. Yeah. So now I have selected the subgraph and I can put this in um, what we call our, our query view. And then I can take this and I can turn this into variables. And now I actually have um, what we call the system automatically wrote this Sparkle query and it got a whole bunch of um, results back of shared investments between people that invested in or Couchbase or uh, um, in a, a, a MongoDB. Anyway, please remember this particular query because I'm going to get back to this one in my Python demo. All right. So I hope you have a little bit of a feel for the data. One more thing. So I already clicked on a particular um, 
venture. So here's a particular venture round that I could click at. Yeah, this is how an investment round looked like. It's uh, the date when they had the investment, investment month, and the investment quarter, uh, the amount raised. And actually, if I wanted to, I can um, hit a thing here. And you see that the underlying stuff is actually triples. Yeah, so here you see it's uh, six and a half million as an integer. Okay, but I think I've given you enough of a background. So now let's go to the demo. So we have, I think, um, we opened the database, Crunchbase. Um, yeah, we opened the database, I believe. I'm adding a number of namespaces to the database, yeah, so that I don't have to type complete URIs. No, no human being I know likes to type URIs. Yeah, so I'm adding Crunch namespaces. And now I'm going to do some queries. Now here's a query that you can do both in a in a graph database and say in Mongo. Yeah, you have a query where you say select every quarter an amount where there's a round that has raised in a particular amount, and the investee was MongoDB, and the invest and the funded quarter was this particular quarter. Yeah, and the amount was more than a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, and then order by Quarter. So I'm, I can take this particular query, and then I can execute the query. So RS mean RS mean run Sparkle and print the results. So, so um, let me do this again. Yeah. So I can do this query, and then I find how much money they got in various quarters. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. And of course, you can do this both in Mongo and in Lego Graph. Um, in Mongo, you can return objects instead of just values. We can do that too. I can say retrieve a document based on uh, query number two, and I get all the objects back. Yeah, that's um, well, all the funding round in MongoDB. Now, of course, this looks kind of awful, so I can pretty print say the first elements of these lists. Yeah, and then you see two investment rounds for MongoDB. Yeah, the full objects. Um, so this is still, uh, this is basically what MongoDB does. Um, then we can do simple aggregation. Again, still doable in MongoDB. So I want to say uh, how many investors were there in MongoDB. I can take this particular query. And I can execute the query. And uh, we see that Union Square Ventures invested the most in Mongo in this particular data set that I have. But remember, it's up to 2014, so we don't have all of them. And then we get to things that I think are really, really hard to do uh, in MongoDB, because this involves doing a complicated join. Yeah, remember the query that I just showed you in Graph? Uh, let me go to this query here. This was the query where we tried to find out Actually, let me go back to the graph view here. Yeah, we wanted to do a query to find investors like Sequoia and Document that invested in the document store, but also did other ventures where they invested in someone else. Yeah, and, and so the query that I'm showing you here is that query again. Yeah, there's a funding round in MongoDB with an investor, investor two, and there's a funding round in Couchbase with investor one, and then there's a funding round that has both investor and investor one and investor two, sorry, investor one and investor two, and that company has a category category and then group by just like in the relational database and then order by descending count. And I can do this query and then if I execute it, yeah, then I see that what they mostly invest in is uh, enterprise software and other software and mobile and analytics. And by the way, these numbers don't mean too much because I probably should correct these numbers for how many people actually invest in enterprise software in the entire Crunchbase database. But this is a good start, yeah, for something interesting. Then, yeah, and I hope you also realize that this is something that's just impossible in, in any any document store, yeah, because it's a complex join. Then most document stores, of course, offer free indexing. We offer free text indexing, so I could say, give me all the things that match MongoDB. 
Now, remember, I store, we, in this case, I look at any place where I can find MongoDB in any object anywhere. So when I look at that, I get about 15 of these objects. But I can say, no, I only want to look for MongoDB in the source. That's the source that I stored for an object. And I get still almost the same. Or only give me objects that match MongoDB in the title. And now suddenly we get MongoDB Inc. Only MongoDB. Yeah, so we offer the same free text index that you could do with the document store. And then again, another thing that's impossible with any document store, which is social network analytics. Yeah, so um, you might remember that one of the things I was doing in Graph is I, let me go back a little bit, if, I can, if you can see the screen. Yeah, at some point we were here, and you might remember that I selected four predicates in all the types of edges that I had. So I selected acquirer, acquiree, and I selected investor and investee. Yeah. Now what I actually do here is I create a generator, meaning it's a first class object. If I apply it to any node, it will try to find all the relationships for that particular object. And that is an, a, a generator you use to do shortest path. So if I, for example, want to find the shortest path between Docomo Capital and Union Square Ventures, I draw the line and it uses this thing then to find uh, all the shortest path between, and, and remember, by the way, look at these lines here. Yeah, so these are the shortest path to going from Docomo to Union Squares. And I selected only three of them just for fun for right now. Okay, so you understand what we're doing there, but you can do this also directly in Python and then programmatically. So I can, um, th these generators are generated in their own particular graph. So right now I created, killed the graph. And now when I create a generator in Python, I give it the name and that is investment or acquisition. And I want to do undirected search um, using the investor relationship, the investee relationship, the acquirer and acquiree uh, relationship. Okay. So I generate this generator, and here's the triples that were generated from this. And now I do a, query, a shortest path query directly in Sparkle. I say, select the label, the node ID, and the path, and use bidirectional search. Yeah? Starting with MongoDB, so start with MongoDB and give me then every node, node ID and path in a particular path. Yeah. And find the shortest path using the inf or ac generator to get to Couchbase. Yeah. So try to go from MongoDB to Couchbase using this particular generator that we created here. So I can I can execute this. Oh, it jumped way too, way too many steps. Sorry about that. Yeah, so I'm, I execute this query. And what you see here is, what you get back is, uh, well, the label uh, path number zero starts with MongoDB. And then the next in the path in this particular venture, number two in the path zero. And then new enterprises is the second part of the path zero. Now this looks a little bit horrible. So for the Pythonistas in your in, in, the, in the audience, I can also show this slightly better by doing this query here. And you'll get the code later, so you can look at it. Yeah, basically, I show them as lists. And so here you see the same thing you saw in Graph from MongoDB to Dispensure to New Enterprise Associates to a private equity firm, uh, Mayfield Fund, that then ultimately uh, invested into Couchbase. Yeah. All right, so that's all I wanted to do for JSON-LD as a, as, a, as a mechanism for CRUD. Now let's go to Shackle. So let me go back to my presentation. So Shackle, yeah. Um, now, semantic graphs allow you to be very, very wild with your data, yeah? Triples can be added without any schema def de uh, definition. You can just say whatever you want to say. I can say Jan likes pizza, pizza made in Oakland, Oakland part of Germany. Yeah? And the 
semantic graph database doesn't care. It, it will just take anything and, and index it. But and that's great. It makes things very flexible. But most enterprises that we know find that too flexible. Yeah. So the most asked question that we got in the last two years is, um, do you also support shackle validation? Yeah. It was the most question, the most asked question. And so we um, finally decided to implement it. And um, what we actually see now in the marketplace is Shackle seems to be replacing OWL for data definitions. It's way easier to read, less complicated. And if you want to create OWL from Shackle, it's very easy to do. Yeah? And there's great tutorials on the web. Um, if you want to learn about Sparkle, just go, Shackle, just go to the W3C website and look for the shape constraint language. There's actually lots of really good examples. Um, and if I have to explain Shackle to people that don't know much about it, then let me say it this way. It's a, and I got this from a top quadrant tutorial. Now it's a data modeling language, yeah, developed by WCC. It describes the shapes of the data, yeah. And you'll see what a shape is a little bit later. And it does the same thing that all this. It describes which property goes with what classes, and then you can define constraint on the data with standardized and declared models instead of writing code to do your, 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 your uh, um, validation. There's a whole bunch of constraints that are already built in. There's cardinality, value types, and large values. And you can actually make your own if you wanted to. And then there's validation tools where you can apply your shackle shapes against the data that you have. So, and then when you want to do your validation, there's two ways to do it. One is that something that everyone offers is you can go to command line, you call it tool AG tool, shackle validate. Then you say the data that I want to validate is in the default graph and the shapes graph, the one the, the thing that contains the shackle definitions is in this particular graph, yeah, and apply it to the database crunch for shackle. Yeah. And then you get a validation report and in this case, and I'll show you in a minute that it doesn't conform. The number of shapes that graphs we looked at was one, the number of data graphs is one, and within the data graph there was only one node shape, so only one, and we looked at 10 nodes. Yeah. And then here you see, for example, that the has raised amount created a violation because the value for has raised amount was only five thousand dollars. And um we have a rule that you have at least ten thousand dollars in a uh, particular uh, investment. Anyway, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. And then the other thing, and I think we're fairly unique with that, is we have deep integration of Shackle with Sparkle. So within your Sparkle query, you can directly call a validation function. Yeah, and this is on our website, so just have a look at it. And I'm just going to demonstrate it for you in a second. Yeah. So let me go to the um, let me go to the demo, and then we're almost there. So here is again my um, my Python. So if you want to do validation, yeah, with Shackle, then one way to do it is to, for example, say, well, do do it in Turtle, which is one of the triple formats, where you say, well, I'm making a thing that is a node shape. Yeah, and apply it to a class in my database called funding round. Yeah, and one property is that if I have an investee, I have to have exactly one investee. Yeah, but if I look at the property investor, then I only need at least one, but I can have multiple. And then for the has raised amount in US dollars, it has to be the data type integer. And I and it's an error if the investment is less than ten thousand yeah. dollars. So this is now this is again in Turtle. So your application developer would have to learn Turtle. So again, we also make it possible to do it in JSON LD. Yeah. So you can actually um, create your shape in JSON LD. You you get the context from a Shackle context. Let me actually show you what we do here instead of talking about it. Um, so let me, so we have a shackle context, and you see that here, yeah, yeah, F is using namespaces for France, schema, and S is shackle, 
and then you see data type, min count, max exclusive. You see if you see a data type, then the type always is an int, is an uh, XSD uh, URI. Anyway, here's the, the shackle context, and then we have a shape. And so now we have the shape, which as a part has the shackle context. And so now let's use it. Yeah, so I'm closing, oops, I'm closing, um, I don't know what I did here. Close the current database. I open a little test database and then um, I clear it. So now it's empty. I add some namespaces to it. And then in the beginning of my demo, I loaded 176,000 JSON LD objects from a file. And in this line, I say actually copy only, only take the funding rounds of this big thing here and then take take the first 10 of these objects. Again, this is only for Pythonistas, yes? So now I have a list called X. Yeah, so let's see, uh, pretty print X zero. Yeah, so here is one investment round for uh, uh, this company new April midstream. Anyway, this is not one. And because I want to do validation, I'm going to mutilate a bunch of projects. Yeah, so one thing which I just explained is that I need to have exactly one infest so I'm going to delete the infest for the first object then I'm going to delete investor for the second object then I'm going to make the race has raised amount to four hundred dollars instead of a big much bigger number so we'll file it property three and I do also I turn the raised amount in a string instead of an integer then I make the UIDs, the IDs of the objects a little bit easier to read, forget about it. And I'm adding the data to the database. Yeah. And so now the data is in the database. Then I want to put my shackle into a graph. So I make a graph object or RDFI graph. So if I look at the graph, you see it looks like a string, but actually if I look at the type, it's a uh, and the Lego graph uh, URI part. But anyway, so I have a graph, and now I add the shape to the database. I think I haven't done that yet. No. And now I can, on the command line, validate my little database. So I can go to um, this database. I did it already before. And here we see all the things that I validated yeah so it doesn't conform because there are all bunch of errors the number of shapes that I looked at is one data graph is only one there's not only one sh shackle shape so that's only one and here's a very important number I looked at ten nodes yeah if you make any error anywhere in your shackle validation or in your graph or any say shackle validator will happily say that everything is fine but please always check if it actually checked a bunch of nodes here and then you see the actual validation results. Uh, you see that it was for amount USD. The value was 5,000, which was not good. So the min inclusive constraint component was, was triggered, and it's a violation, etc. Yeah? So you can do this on the command line. But I told you we also um, integrated the Sparkle. So let me show you how that works. So let me create um, an earlier report that I had. Actually, that's not even in the database yet, but in case it was there. So I can actually validate the data directly from Sparkle. Here I say, insert in the database graph validation one. So this is the thing that will tie everything together. And then SPO where, oops, where SPO is the validation report within the default graph for this particular shackle graph. Yeah. So now when I execute this, now it actually inserted the validation report in the database. So now if we go back to graph and I open the file crunchbase for shackle, Then I can look at some objects in the database, and I'm looking at the validation report. And here we see one. 
And then I can look in the outline view. Well, let me actually also uh, select all the predicates in the system. And so here's my validation report. And you say it, there's no, it, is, it doesn't conform. Uh, and then here I can look at each of the, valid, uh, the, the, the validation problems. Yeah, like the raised amount was a violation of the min includes a constraint component because the value was 5,000. Yeah, and then I go, can go through each. And then, of course, what I can do, so I can add the validation report to the database, and then I can do Sparkle queries on top of that to actually do Sparkle query to find what objects actually failed. Yeah, So it's a beautiful system that all fits together. Um, now, doing um, uh, a validation on a, a database with a billion objects in, in one default graph can be really, really expensive. Yeah, because you have to look at each object cardinality. So what most people actually do is when they keep track of the latest objects that they add to the database. And then what you do is you bind a sparkle list to the objects that you actually want to look at. So instead of looking at the entire graph, you make a list of the objects that you currently want to look at. You make that notes. And then you can also, again, do your validation, but in this case, you do it within the default graph for your data. The nodes graph is graph one, and the nodes that you apply it to are the nodes that you put in this list. Yeah? And that will work way faster on a, on a, on a database with a billion queries. Um, anyway, so that was actually the demo I wanted to give. Um, so let me finish with this part, and then we'll take some questions. Yeah, so. Everything I did today was to show we can life we can make life easier for user experience and application developers that need to work with knowledge graphs. Yeah, because JSON LD hides the complexity of semantics in graphs, and Shackle is a very easy way to validate new data. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, great. Um, thanks, Jan. We're um, so if, if we can answer a few questions as they came in. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and type those into the, the question box. Uh, we've got a couple here that we're going to tackle it as we go. We're uh, we're running a little bit longer than expected, so we're only going to take a few here. And then, like I said, if you feel free to type your question in, and if uh, we don't get to it in the the voiceover, then we'll uh, we'll respond to you directly. So, uh, just real quick, Jan, one of the questions was: Are any of these Python modules exclusive to AG? The ones you're showing. Uh, yes. All right. Are we going to make those available here in the near future? So, a, we... a Python client is uh, open source you can find it on github you can install it with pip install or anaconda um, and the crud the the, the, the the simple crud layer that i created i'll make available on github so you can do the same thing you can use it as an example again if it's just a simple layer it's, it's all layered on top of our a regular python interface okay um, next question, uh, is it possible to do the data validation upon insertion instead of waiting until the data is already inserted? Um, no, the model that we have here assumes that you um, have the data inserted, but here is something that might make you happy, yeah? Um, if you are in a session mode with a Lego graph, you can actually insert objects and not commit them yet, then apply the shackle to the objects, to, to the latest set of objects that you added. And then if, there, if the data does not confirm, you just do a rollback. And if the data does conform, you do the commit. Yeah. So that would be a very, I actually wanted to show you today that little, uh, uh, Workflow, but I didn't get to it. But it's incredibly easy to implement. Okay. Uh, next question is: Can I still do reasoning with this approach? Yeah, you can do any. Uh, I mean, it's, the JSON LD is stored as objects. You can retrieve them as objects, but it's also a fully 100% semantic graph. So reasoning works. Our prolog rules will work on top of it. Uh, anything you can think of will work that works in the Lego graph. Okay. Um, let's see here. So uh, here's a question. I've been reading about digital twins, and they share some commonality with knowledge graphs. Do you have some thoughts on that? 
Uh, okay. Um, well, I was just at a conference about knowledge graphs in um, in Germany, as I said earlier today. And most graphs, or most talks are about knowledge graphs. Some talks about were about digital twins. Where a digital twin is like a knowledge graph that people apply to operational processes in, say, a manufacturing place or, or factories or, well, in, th in, in places where things move. <laughs> and yeah, I would say it's a specialization of knowledge graphs, but very much directed at uh, enterprises and manufacturing. Okay, and let's just do one more since we're running out of time. Um, I, you mentioned triple attributes and how they add properties. Can you expand on what you mean by that? Um, so every triple in Allegro graph can have um, adjacent object attached with key value pairs. Yeah. So you could, if in theory, you can add date or an expiration date to every triple. You can add a security level to every date, every every triple. You can. Um, you can have the owner or the author. I mean, anything you want, anything you can do in the property graph database in terms of the, 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 the metadata that you can put on an edge, you can do with triple attributes in a Lego graph. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, everyone, we appreciate your time and your interest in joining and learning more about Shackle and JSON-LD in a Lego graph. Uh, we welcome you to join our next webcast on October 23rd, The Knowledge Graph That Listens. To register for that, go to allegrograph.com. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at Franz Inc. for more information about uh, conferences and things like that where we can uh, meet in person. Again, thanks a lot, and we look forward to talking to you next time. Have a good day.